Hello and welcome to the first episode of You Can Learn Science. I made this video in response to Veritasium's video about the Kelvin's thunderstorm, which is an experiment that you can make to generate electricity from falling water. If you've never heard of Kelvin's thunderstorm before, then go check out their video. He explains how Kelvin's thunderstorm works to generate electricity from falling water, but at the end of the video, he asks where the electrical energy comes from. How can sparks be made from falling water? I was utterly intrigued, so immediately I started to think about it. As I was thinking about it, and how this Kelvin's thunderstorm worked, it reminded me a piece of a piece of scientific equipment that I've come across in my time as a physics educator called a Wimshurst machine. If you haven't heard of a Wimshurst machine before, then here's one in action. The Wimshurst machine has got some notable similarities to the Kelvin water dropper. Uh, first of all, the moving water is a little bit like the moving discs of the Wimshurst machine. So the water comes down and is circulated back up again. Likewise, with the Wimshurst machine, the disc rotates round and ends up back to where it started. On the Kelvin water dropper as well, there's two of them, one circulating one lot of water, the other circulating another lot of water. Likewise with the Wimshurst machine, it's got two circulating discs, one at the front and one at the back. Another similarity that I noticed is how they store the charge. So with the Kelvin water dropper, the charge is stored on the uh, wire meshes uh, and then as the charged water comes through, uh, the wire meshes collect the uh, charge. With the Wimshurst machine, uh, the charge is collected on Leyden jars. So there's similarities there with that they both store charge. Another similarity uh, that I'll point out is the spark gap. So the Kelvin water dropper has got a spark gap, which I just circled there. And the Wimshurst machine has got a similar spark gap uh, on it as well. Final similarity that I spotted was that there's no build up of, build up of charge when the whole thing is stationary. So in other words, when the Kelvin water dropper when there's no water flowing, you don't get any charge buildup. And likewise with the Wimshurst machine, if you're not turning the handle, then nothing happens. So there's two similarities that got me thinking um, about how to solve this problem, thinking about the Wimshurst machine. Despite these similarities and differences between these machines, we're still not any close to ans answering Veritasium's question about where the electrical energy generated by the Kelvin thunderstorm comes from. To answer this, we need to think about the forces on the charged water droplets as they're falling. So let's take a look at the forces on the water droplets as they're falling, because it's not as simple as it first seems. The first force we need to consider is the downward force from the droplet due to the gravity, otherwise known as its weight. Next up we need to consider the upward force on the droplet as it's falling. The first one of these is the drag force or air resistance. As the droplet is falling through your air, there's also an upward force caused by buoyancy. This buoyancy is the same upward force that causes a helium balloon to rise when you let go of it. The three forces I've mentioned so far are the forces on water droplets falling in a regular thunderstorm. But droplets in a Kelvin thunderstorm are charged, so there's a fourth force at play here. Because the surface that the charged droplets are falling to has the same charge as the drops themselves, there's a repelling force in an upwards direction. This force is the electrostatic force given by Q1, which is the charge of the droplets, times Q2, which is the charge of the surface that it's landing on, over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, where r is the distance between the drops and the surface it is about to land on. What this tells us is that water droplets that are charged falling in a Kelvin thunderstorm have a larger net force upwards, so accelerate less, so reach a lower velocity and have lower kinetic energy. Now we're getting somewhere towards an answer because we're talking about the energy. The energy of this system comes in uh, the form of gravitational potential energy of the water. Energy was needed to lift the water for it to then fall again. When it falls, this gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy, which itself is distributed and dissipated in three ways. First, firstly, some of the kinetic energy is dissipated as sound as the drops land. Secondly, some kinetic energy is dissipated as heat, warming the drops up ever so slightly as they land on the ground. 
And thirdly, some of the kinetic energy is converted to electrical potential energy because some of the energy was needed to separate the positive and negative charges. When you've separated the charges, uh, there is the potential for these charges to come together and start moving towards each other, thus releasing their energy as a spark. To ultimately see what happens to this energy, let's take a look at how the electric potential energy is dissipated. Firstly, we get some light from the spark. Secondly, we get some heat from the spark. And thirdly, we get some sound from the spark. The light then travels towards an object like your eyes, where photons of light are absorbed, thus heating the object ever so slightly. If we look at the energy that we end up with, we have various things with more heat than before and various sounds being made. Water that falls to the ground in a regular thunderstorm converts its gravitational potential energy to heat and sound, which is pretty cool. But I think you'll agree that it's nowhere near as cool as the heat and sound produced when water falls through a Kelvin thunderstorm. I'd be really keen to know what you think of my theory, so any comments below would be happily received. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you never stop learning about science.